Hello, everybody. Good morning. My name is Francesco Bullo. I'm delighted to be here today to have a chance to uh, tell you about, uh, cover some um, hopefully exciting materials about uh, network systems. Uh, this is a, These are lectures for my course uh, 269 at uh, UC Santa Barbara on, on network systems dynamics and control. Uh, the, the lecture notes are available freely on my website, which uh, is referred to here. And this is lecture one. I would like to talk to you about, um, about some problems and about some systems, some example problem and example systems that are going to motivate what we will uh, cover. Um, essentially, we will uh, be describing um, uh, some elements of matrix theory and graph theory and, and how those tools are useful to model and analyze the dynamical behaviors over, over networks in which in which agents interact, in which commodities flow, in which um, uh, computations happen in a distributed way and so forth. So the purpose of this first chapter is to, um, is to cover some examples. Specifically, I will have, I will have four, four examples uh, that I will talk about. Um, and let's let's uh, create a little table here. Uh, basically, I'll talk about two different types of dynamics. One I will refer to as averaging dynamics over network. And then I will talk about a dynamics called flow. I will, I will be referring to a, a flows of uh, commodities over flow networks. As I'll talk about these two dynamics as being two of the fundamental dynamics that occur in a multi-agent distributed system, and we will study this. Uh, we will study this essentially. We'll study both um, the case in which uh, this 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 dynamics take place in a discrete time, um, as well as it will be instructive and helpful to look at them in continuous time. And we will also be looking at um, um, open versus uh, uh, versus closed systems. So hopefully, by the end of this uh, lecture, you will have a little bit of an idea of what uh, these words uh, mean. Um, one more one more detail. This is the first uh, chapter, the first lecture of 10. So I intended to be a cycle of 10 lectures to begin with. Um, these are precisely corresponding to the first 10 chapters in, in the book. Um, perfect. So uh, let me get started now with the first dynamic. So um, the first example is opinion dynamics in social influence uh, networks. So uh, the setup is as follows. Imagine the uh, agents uh, in these examples are individuals in a group or in a team. And um, for simplicity, imagine that each individual uh, has an opinion, a number PI. So this is the opinion of individual I, right? There's perhaps a group of uh, N individuals, right? And uh, maybe we'll assume that the opinion PI takes value in, in the reals. Um, in, in the text, there is a slightly more general setup, but, uh, but uh, for now, let's, let's imagine. And imagine that as an outcome of a conversation a long time, after some amount of time that you have discussed matters with uh, the other individuals in the team, your individual I, and you, you have to decide what is the, uh, the next value of your opinion. And in doing so, what you do is you take into account potentially everybody else's opinions and you accord to them some influence. So it makes sense to postulate the existence of some coefficients, AIJ. So this, by this, I mean to say the influence that individual I accords to individual J. Right, and so what, what does it make sense to assume about these influence weights that uh, that uh, are accorded for, by an individual to another individual? So, in this case, I would say we will assume that AIJ is naturally non-negative. Right, you uh, at least in the first setup, you assume that uh, um, that you you give positive weights or zero to every individual around surrounding you. And, and the second assumption is that as you, as you listen to multiple opinions, you perform a convex combination of those opinions. So the, these influence weights are 
convex combination coefficients, or another way to think about them, they're percentages. So perhaps you remain 90% attached to your own opinion if you happen to be a relatively stubborn individual. And, and maybe you, or maybe it's much less than 90, maybe you accord 50% to yourself and maybe you accord to other individuals some arbitrary percentage. And so, so um, mathematically, what that means is that as you consider individual I and you look at all of the individuals that I accords to J and you sum over J, notice that this sum includes I uh, uh, itself, then this number ends up being one. So these are these are convex combination coefficients or, or percentages, right? Perfect. So this particular model here that I have just described, each individual executes the same, the same dynamics. This is in discrete time, right? Um, and um, this dynamics has a beautiful history. It, uh, it goes back originally to the work by two famous sociologists and graph theoreticians, uh, uh, French and Harari in, in, in the 50s. However, it was popularized later by a statistician, De Groot, in, in the 74. So it's often referred to as the De Groot model, even though um, uh, it has deeper and older, and older uh, roots. So I will, um, one second. Perfect. All right. So this is the degree dynamics. Um, let's write it in vector form. So um, um, if you take all of these uh, uh, convex combination coefficients, you can easily define a matrix, which is an uh, there were n agents, so it's an n by n dimensional matrix, uh, where you um, uh, collect uh, in in any in any row, you collect uh, the the weights. For example, these are all the weights that individual one occurs to the other individuals, all the way through individual n to the other individuals. And this is a matrix that um, that has two properties. Uh, one is, as we were saying, entry wise, the matrix is non-negative, um, and I will use the symbol greater than or equal to even for a matrix to denote non-negative matrices um, or matrices whose entries are non-negative. And then it has the feature that each row sum uh, is equal to one. So each row sums to one. And so um, one, one way of writing that in a single compact equation is to write a formula such as this, where, where the vector one N is a, is a vector, uh, all of whose entries are equal to the number one. And it's again a vector in dimension n. And so um, recall, as you perform uh, 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 matrix vector multiplications, uh, you are basically, when you multiply the matrix A by the vector one, you are performing row sums. Perfect. So a matrix that has both of these properties, I will refer to as a row stochastic matrix. And um, we will be writing this dynamics. Uh, let's imagine that we let K denote a, a discrete time uh, variable. Then we would write X at time K plus one, it's equal to A X at time K as the, the group dynamics in vector form. Hmm? Now, um, before we leave these examples, let's summarize uh, what, what may make sense to consider in the future. So. Um, um, not precisely the topic of this course, but still very much of scientific interest is the following question. Is this model, uh, uh, you know, believable in some sense? Uh, is there an empirical evidence in, in its support? And the, the answer to both of these questions is, is very positive. And, and yes, there is. Uh, also of interest is how would one measure these coefficients? So that's also very much of psychological and, and cognitive and cognitive interest. For us, slightly you know, more, more related to the topic of this course is under what conditions do the dynamics converge to a final equilibrium? Um, and when is it true that the agents achieve consensus? Hmm? Mm -hmm. Again, in what follows, I will refer to agents, individuals, and nodes uh, uh, as synonyms. Um, and then, and then finally, going back to, to sociology, one may also ask the question, what may be more realistic, uh, empirically motivated models? Uh, let me make a comment. This is uh, one last comment. This is a closed system. There is no input in this system. Um, and I will speculate more on, uh, on that a little bit later. We'll come back to this. So basically what we have done is we have, we have written down the first of these dynamics here. This is a very simple, uh, discrete time linear system and the key properties that hey is a matrix that is row stochastic. 
it is, in other words, it is a non-negative uh, unit uh, uh, row sum matrix. Uh, let me uh, draw my little beautiful square here. One, two, three, four. There. Um, we've seen we've seen now only the first of the four examples that I want to show you. So let's uh, let's proceed and now look at a second example. Um, uh, let me show you, actually, before I show you a second example, let me show you one more example, one more application of the, of the averaging discrete time dynamics. So we've seen an, an example from science, where from sociology, where individuals perform um, uh, local com convex combinations uh, of, their, of their values. Let's look at an example which arises in engineering. Imagine you have, as depicted here, a collection of nodes of, of wireless uh, sensor nodes, right? Uh, each of these nodes is capable of performing local computation and sensing. Perhaps you're sensing uh, physical quantities such as temperature, vibrations, or light. Then as, an, as, a, as a node, as a small computer, you perform some local computations. It transmits some information. And in turn, perhaps this information leaves the network and goes to an operator. So this could be very well an engineering uh, device. And imagine that you are the, the designer and now you have to design an interaction protocol. So what does this node execute as a function of time? What rules, what is it, an engineering protocol? And so here is a, <coughs> a recommendation for a protocol. Imagine you adopt perhaps a very simple protocol, maybe the simplest of protocols. So you are node I again, and you receive communications from all of your neighboring nodes in some sense, which I'll need to clarify. And when you perform, you perform this equation. So at each time you, you look at all of the messages that you have received, you look at your own value and you perform the exact average. So for example, specifically, if you are node one in this topology here, you receive only messages from node two and you execute this dynamics here, which is one half, one half zero times the vector X. Hmm? If you are node two, in this example, node two talks with every other node. So there are four nodes in this example. Therefore, the row of the matrix is a row with entries equal to one fourth, one fourth, one fourth, one fourth, right? I will uh, make a note of this particular matrix. Uh, let's refer to this example as a wireless sensor network. I will use this example uh, in, in, in the future chapters. Notice that this is, of course, raw stochastic. It's exactly the same as in the first example, is in the Groot, in the, the Groot uh, French Ferrari. Here, one thing that changes, perhaps, is the type of questions that you may be interested in. Now, these are, these are design questions. You want to know, again, if you reach consensus, you want to know, perhaps you wanted to, your wireless sensor network to compute the exact average of the initial conditions at each node. So you wanted to achieve something called average consensus. So does this protocol that I've just described for you, this very simple equation, does that achieve average consensus? That will be of interest. And the second question is, if you come back to this, to this picture here, if you realize this dynamics as described in, this, uh, uh, in these equations is entirely determined by the topology of the graph. So when you look at the graph from the graph, you can you can compute you can compute the matrix, and, and then you can study the properties of that discrete time algorithm. So now the question is, what are the graph theoretical properties? What properties does the graph have, need to have in order for the matrix to to behave in a certain way, and ultimately for the algorithm to converge? So this is what we are going to want to understand the relationship between graphs and matrices. And, and finally, again, from an engineering point of view is how quick is this convergence? All right, with this, we have completed our motivation of the first discrete time averaging algorithm. Let us now talk about our second example dynamics. And I am going to draw inspiration from animal behavior. So the second example is the example of flocking dynamics in, in animal behavior. So, here, these are, these are pictures. Um, uh, this is a picture where 
the group of animals is moving in a coordinated fashion. And essentially, I would re refer to this as a one-dimensional example, in the sense that the structure that is being constructed is one-dimensional. And you can imagine that each, uh, each uh, uh, animal, each goose in this example, would be interacting only with, with neighbors along a one-dimensional graph structure or graphical structure. Here instead, this is an example of, of uh, fish swarming where the, um, the, the set of interactions between the animals is essentially three-dimensional. There are of course also examples of two dimensions and, and one can certainly consider abstract interactions in four dimensions and higher. So how would animals, you know, animals exhibit coordinated behavior? It is unclear that it is, in fact, there are, there's evidence that it is not, there isn't a single coordinating centralized unit. It, the coordinated behavior arises out of distributed interactions. So what may these distributed interactions be? Here is a simple, uh, a simple idea. So imagine you are uh, this particular, this particular fish here in the middle, um, and you, um, this particular fish here in the middle. And for simplicity here, I consider a situation where essentially all of the neighbors of that in, of that individual are are headed more or less in the same direction, right? So now you are uh, observing your um, your neighbors. And the, the postulate, the assumption now, the axiom I'm going to propose to you that perhaps what this animal will perceive, it will perceive a, a force. It will perceive some, some form of a, it will perceive a desire to align itself with its neighbors, right? So this alignment rule, it's a spring-like attractive rule. If you, are, if you are very close, perhaps you perceive a, a very minimal desire to realign yourself. And if you're very far, it's a stronger desire. So I refer to it as a force from a mechanical engineering point of view. Of course, this would be a torque. So now, how would you write such, such an equation for this case? So let's just take, take it one step at a time. Um, so perhaps imagine you have a single, a single neighbor. So if you are fish I, you now your, your dynamics now is in, is in continuous time. So this is now theta I dot animals move in continuous time. And if, if you have a one neighbor, J, then perhaps what you do is you're just attracted to J. Attracted to J is theta J minus theta R. Hmm? Because if theta J is larger than theta I, then theta I dot is positive. So theta I is increasing. And if theta J is lower than theta I, then theta I dot is negative, it's decreasing. Now, for simplicity here, I should be scaling this. Maybe there will be a, an absolute uh, a factor multiplying all of this, but let's just set that to one for, for just a few seconds. Um, now, if you have two neighbors, well, perhaps you accord the equal influence to both of them. So then you say, well, maybe I'll do one half of the attraction to neighbor one. Uh, in this particular case, it's neighbor J sub one. Um, and then I do one half of the attraction to neighbor J sub two. Um, more generally, if I, if I have a collection of neighbors, you know, maybe, maybe M, what you could do is you could just simply say, well, I perceive one M uh, attraction towards neighbor J sub one all the way through one over M attraction of neighbor to neighbor J sub M. Now, it's a very simple algebraic arithmetic calculation. You, you, you just uh, expand those parentheses and recollect them to notice that this is an entirely equivalent to doing this operation. You, you compute the average of the headings of your neighbors, and then you compare that and subtract away your, your individual heading. So then this is a good thing because averaging, we just saw in the previous two examples, right? Except that now this is, this is a completely different um, domain right here we're in ecology we are not in sociology or or, or sensor networks um, and um, this is in continuous time now how would I write this well uh, you know if you if you write this as a vector equation you'd write theta dot equal to now you need to perform the average of your neighbors but we just described that the matrix a a row stochastic matrix a is is a matrix that embodies averaging operations. So it would be A theta minus theta, right? If I want, I can write this as A minus I N, which multiplies theta. And so this is a new matrix, right? This is a new matrix that describes the continuous time dynamics 
a flocking dynamics, but essentially this flocking dynamics is again an averaging dynamics because as you move, you move towards the average of the value of your neighbors. So you are, there's some kind of averaging that is occurring. So in graph theory, uh, you should know that there is a, a rich history of, of, um, of matrices associated to graphs. And um, in particular, I would like to define now a matrix called the Laplacian matrix. So if you give me uh, a matrix A, hmm, I can take the diagonal matrix whose entries are the row sums of A. In our particular case, because A was satisfying the um, unit row sum um, assumption, then clearly the diagonal of A1n, it's equal to identity sub n. And so bottom line, uh, um, we, it, is, it is convenient because of the history and the tradition in graph theory to define a matrix called the Laplacian matrix and to write the equation theta dot equal to minus L theta minus L theta. And so this um, um, flocking dy dynamics uh, is described by something called a Laplacian flow, or, or perhaps sometimes you will find minus the Laplacian flow, right? And um, this is again a scientific problem, right? Because we're studying animal behavior. So, you know, the questions may be, is this, uh, is this model at all reasonable? in understanding and reproducing animal behavior. Um, is it true that uh, there may be an equilibrium heading and, and will, the, will the animals do achieve such individual, such equilibrium heading? And when they do achieve in equilibrium heading, then people would say that the animals are flocking. And um, what are the properties that the graph needs to have in order for this flocking to occur? And if you go back to these pictures, in fact, these are all pictures in which the animals while they have a different position in space, naturally, they, they do have a very similar heading. Now, this is, of course, a very simplified model because I really should be describing for you the fact that the interaction graph between the interaction rule between the animals depends upon their physical position. I should also be concerned with the fact that angles don't live on a line, they live on a, on a, on a, on a circular manifold, on a torus. There are several simplifications here, but let's just summarize this discussion and go back to our collection of examples here and just say that essentially we have seen that we have seen that in continuous time we can write uh, our averaging dynamics as minus L sub time T where the matrix L is a Laplacian. And we will want to study the properties of this of this Laplacian matrix. So next, we are going to study a, a compartmental a compartmental systems, dynamical flow systems, uh, flow networks. These are all essential synonyms for uh, pretty much the same the same set of problems. So. <clears throat> Um, then I, right here, the synonyms are dynamical flow systems, compartmental systems, network flow systems, and so forth. So these are systems in which the agents are, are compartments. The agents store quantity. That quantity is typically referred to as a commodity. And this commodity flows among the compartments. And so examples could be power grids or, or more generally energy systems, water and gas distribution networks, uh, routing problem, data routing networks, hmm? such as communication, but also, also traffic networks, uh, um, or, uh, road networks, uh, railroads, um, and maybe even the movements of, of, of humans in a, in a, in a residential, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an area and, and logistic networks, right? So quantities, commodities are flowing. So a very um, elegant example to start with originated, uh, which, which had a major impact in, 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 um, in the study of ecosystems is the work by uh, Neumeier in 1973, which talks about desert ecosystems and specifically models <clears throat> the, um, the motion of water through uh, in the desert, the flow of water. So here's a very simple a picture. So in, imagine in a desert ecosystem, right? Uh, you may have essentially three compartments. One is the soil can store water, uh, plants, 
stored water and animals, the, the, the few animals that managed to survive in maybe the harsh environment. Now, um, water arrives into the environment because of precipitation, but then it leaves the environment in a number of ways. For example, from the soil, water evaporates, drains, um, drains off and runs off. And uh, plants transpire water and, and animals uh, are subject to evaporation. Mm -hmm. Moreover, um, I uh, should also emphasize that, of course, water moves among, well, I should say, between pairs of compartments inside, inside our, our system. So plants uptake water from the soil and animals drink it. Mm -hmm. So what is happening here? What, what is now happening is that essentially I could draw, I could draw a, some kind of a enclosing shape here. So um, this would be, so everything inside the square here uh, would, would be um, part of my system, right? But my system now, it's not an open system. Sorry, it's not a closed system. It's an open system because some uh, flows enters the, the system, right? This is, this is precipitation and some amount of flow leaves the system. Right, but I've chosen to draw the lines in that particular way. Now, let me comment that essentially, one could argue that, uh, roughly speaking, all of this, um, uh, all all of these systems are are always closed, because it's always possible to wrap uh, 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 loop loop around everything and, and, and talk about this as the as the outer environment, right? The exterior environment, the rest of the world, right? So in that sense, it's always a, these are always closed systems. But for the purpose of studying the desert ecosystem here, we are going to just focus on what's inside the box. And we're going to be thinking about the precipitation as an input and, and this phenomena here on, on the left, as on the right, as, as an outflow. So we're going to have inflows and, and outflows, right? And we are not going to uh, model the entire world, just this particular uh, sets of three, three compartments with inflows and outflows. All right, so how do we how do we write a model for for uh, for interconnected compartments which have flows? So well, let's uh, introduce a variable now. Instead of x, maybe I will use q. Hmm? Earlier we were using we were using p for the opinion. Um, we used um, um, x for the temperature, and then we used um, theta for the angle. So q here are the quantity of commodity at a given compartment i. And we're using again a discrete time uh, uh, k. So now at each time, at each instant of time, so I have a compartment, right? And at time k, there is a quantity qi of k, right? And at each instant of time, some uh, part of the commodity will remain in qi, but some will go, maybe it will go to compartment j, and some other part of the commodity will will outflow so but in one time step 100 percent of the commodity will be divided in these three type of possible uh, situations it may either remain in the compartment go to another compartment or leave the environment so allow me to so let's introduce some notation let's call aij the routing fraction or the split ratios in traffic networks is the fraction of the commodity at compartment I that flows to compartment J in one time step, All right? So A I J is a fraction that goes from I to J in one time step. So because it's a fraction, it has to be non-negative. And then moreover, it's a percentage, right? So what happens to this A I J? What if I were to consider compartment i and imagine where does all of the commodity are compartment i go well if i sum under j from one through n this is summing over i itself and all of the other compartments so now this number is at most one is at most one because at most it is possible that all of the commodity remains in the environment or it could be strictly less than one if there exists an, an out uh, and a connection to the outside wall. So a single outgoing edge, right? So from the animals here, there's an outgoing edge. There could be compartments without outflowing edges. Hmm? So, so this is what we know about the routing uh, fractions, right? They are non-negative and um, 
when summed over the second index, they are at most one. Also, it is possible that there may be an incoming edge, right? And so I will let uh, UI denote the non-negative supply of commodity to compartment I from the outside world. Hmm? Perfect. So then, just like we did before, of course, we assemble these coefficients into the matrix A, and we will refer to the matrix A as a routing matrix. It's a routing matrix because it is telling you where to route the commodity. It reaches a compartment and then it flows out. Now, um, with these definitions, it's possible to write down the simply simply the uh, um, the mass mass balance equation because the commodity is is conserved. So this is the key rule in in uh, flow networks. It's conservation of mass. Here we're writing a discrete time model, and as you can imagine, we'll write continuous time next. And we basically, by writing the district, discrete time mass balance equation for each compartment, we obtain a discrete time dynamical flow system. And so what are the equations? Well, they're the ones uh, highlighted exactly here. So uh, it's a very simple uh, set of equation and it goes as follows. At each, at each time K, right, you have a certain commodity. What is the commodity at compartment I at the next time? Well, it's, it's a sum, well, perhaps there is an, an input into compartment I from the outside world. And then moreover, there are inputs into I potentially from all other compartments J. So from compartment J, now the key, the key thing you need to notice is that this is a JI. So this is the flow of commodity from J to I. And it multiplies QJ. So this is now, now the difference between before, before we had before we had AIJPJ. Um, this was the first example. Here we have AIJQJ, right? Hmm? QJ. What that means is that when you write the equation in vector form, uh, you obtain you obtain A transpose, not A. Hmm? So right now we're writing our dynamical flow system with the transpose of a row, of a row substochastic matrix. Hmm? So two, two things I said, this is the transpose of A and the a matrix whose row sums are less than or equal to one is referred to as a substochastic. Hmm? Perfect, so A transpose Q and now we have an input U. So U is the non-negative vector of, of inflows, right? Uh, right, so here in the text, uh, I repeated this discussion that um, a compartment may have outflow into the environment or may not have outflow in the environment. And you can detect that in the model uh, because these two conditions are if and only if the row sum of the matrix is strictly less than one or the row sum is identically equal to one. If all row sums are equal to one, then we're looking with a closed system in which no commodity leaves. Huh? Um, but in this particular case, uh, the Neumayer Desert Ecosystem Water Flow Model, it's, it's clearly open in the sense that there is precipitation and there's evaporation, for example, right? Um, uh, I wrote down here for you the example of the matrix in the Neumayer uh, case. Um, remember, it had the feature that essentially um, um, there was some kind of a, a three uh, of a of a upper diagonal structure in the sense that uh, water was flowing in and then it was either leaving or flowing to other compartments, but there was no cycle. Um, and so this is this can be observed. We will we'll be thinking about this uh, more carefully later. Uh, this is one coefficient, another coefficient, a third coefficient. So this is an upper three diagonal matrix. Um, right. Um, before I proceed to the, so now let me go back and record what we have discovered so far. So the third example was a discrete time. So here we would write a, a X, let's just always use the variable X here, a time um, um, K plus one, it's equal to A transpose X at time K plus U. And now A is, is a routing matrix, not an averaging matrix. And it is, um, it is rho sub, stochastic. All right. Um, finally, let me uh, briefly show you how one can generalize uh, discrete time models into continuous time. 
flow models, we'll still call QI the compart the commodity at compartment I. And now the amount of commodity that flows from I to J uh, is not a fraction of QI, but it's, uh, um, it's the product between a coefficient FI, which are, which are referred to as flow rate, is a rate that multiplies its positive quantity, Fij, that multiplies Qi. This is the commodity flowing from I to J. And now, if you write the mass balance equation at each compartment as before, now you've write it in an infinitesimal way. So you have, uh, you have the fact that, again, now you, you start by saying Qi dot equal to, well, the easier part is to imagine, of course, there may well be an inflow from the outside. And then here you do need to uh, specifically introduce a coefficient that describes the flow from compartment um, I to the outer world. And that I will use the symbol F0I. So remember F0I times QI is the flow from I to the outer world. Um, because, because of consistency reasons, right? So here we're saying that if FIJQI is the flow out of J, well, basically we are going into the, um, into the uh, outer, um, uh, the, the, the environment. So now, um, next point is that um, you need to write down the uh, interaction, the, the flow from I to J and J to I. You sum over J, J different from I, right? Let's do it like this. And now you need to, you need to com compare, you need to sum and subtract. The flow from J to I is summed. And so that's the first coefficient here, right? This is with a plus sign. The flow from I to J is subtracted. Hmm? Uh, and so that, that's, that's the equation that you end up uh, obtaining. Hmm? That you end up obtaining. Now, um, um, it is possible, just like we did uh, before, to to define a Laplacian matrix. So basically, uh, uh, I will let's introduce some names. I will let F be the flow rate matrix. The flow rate matrix, um, and then I will. I will compute a Laplacian associated to the flow rate matrix. So I'll write L equal to the diagonal of F one vector uh, minus F itself. So that's a Laplacian matrix. And, and that is fine, but that does not fully capture the dynamics uh, of, of the system because there are also outflows. And so we need to introduce a vector F naught, which uh, you know has already appeared here, the vector of outflows, right? This is a vector. Well, the flow rate matrix was non-negative, right? And, and this vector is also uh, a non-negative, right? With N components. And um, it turns out that in this particular case, um, um, the dynamics is written as these two equations. I have Q dot equal to CQ plus U, where C is of this form. So C is of the form, let me write it out for you here explicitly, is of the form minus L transpose minus the diagonal of F naught times Q of T plus U. Hmm? Perfect. So in this particular case for the um, uh, continuous time uh, compartmental flows, we have minus, like before, like because of the Laplacian convention, we have a transpose like in discrete time uh, flow systems, but then we, the matrix that determines the, the dynamics of the system contains also this uh, negative uh, diagonal um, terms that need to be summed. Hmm? Perfect. Such matrices uh, are going to have some properties which we will study in this course. They will be referred to as Metzler matrices. Hmm? And um, again, if you if you remember the the example that with the Neumayer example with soil, plants, and animals, and I forgot one more edge here, then uh, you can uh, I'll, I'll let you do that as an exercise. Uh, you can uh, write down what the um, um, what the flow rate matrix would be, the associated Laplacian, 
the vector of outflows and all of it combined into the matrix C that describes the entire compartmental system. Perfect. Um, in summary of discrete and continuous time models, we've seen that you can write either in discrete time or in continuous time, the dynamics of a flow system. And there are a number of interesting scientific and engineering questions. One is um, imagine that you have constant inflows, maybe very low precipitation, but imagine constant. Does the total mass in the system remain bounded? Can one study such, such questions? Um, is there a single or a multiple final mass distribution among all the nodes? Is it true that the, do you forget the initial conditions? Does an equilibrium for the dynamics exist? If an equilibrium exists, do all convergence, do all solutions converge to it? Or finally, is it true at some at some nodes the 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 the, the mass of this commodity, the amount of commodity could be vanishing to asymptotically, could be exploding, uh, you know, could be oscillating. I guess everything you know may potentially be possible. So how do we how do we understand that? And so now let's just um, uh, go back to to conclude our our table here. It's entirely possible that we will have equations of the form x dot of t. It's equal to minus l transpose plus a diagonal matrix x plus an input u. Such matrices are, are going to be, well, we'll refer to that matrix is equal to cx plus u. c will be a Metzler matrix, which I will review. Notice that. Um, uh, this is now a table of all four examples. On the right, you can see the flow systems, which I have written with, uh, with an input. So these are, these are open systems. They allow inflows and outflows. It's entirely possible to consider the case where there are no inflows and outflows. For example, you may consider a situation where uh, perhaps it's a closed ecosystem and a certain, a certain chemical never leaves or enters. Mm -hmm. the, the environment. So then, then it will be closed. And even though we have not studied, but it is certainly of interest to imagine the situation where perhaps opinions evolve and there are influences coming in from the outside world. Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. So with this, this concludes this concludes my, my chapter. So these are my conclusions. In in the chapter, which you can which you can uh, easily read, there are several additional examples. There is an example of continuous time and discrete time flow systems, which are closed, and such closed systems model the dynamics of, of Markov chains and random walks. Hmm? So uh, if you're interested in stochastic models, I strongly recommend you read this appendix. The, 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 there is a, a different interpretation of it, exactly the same equation as we have, we have seen with a uh, routing matrix now being called the transition matrix. And there is the equivalent in continuous time where uh, the flow rate matrix is called the transition rate matrix, but identical dynamics minus L transpose uh, uh, occurs. Um, I also then have a, a, a couple of examples of robotic behavior where you may have robots that um, uh, are patrolling a perimeter, they are pursuing each other, uh, or they're executing some kind of balancing. So simple examples from, from robotics. And finally, I have two examples of, of um, pardon me, of uh, wireless sensor networks um, uh, where the nodes are performing a more elaborate uh, least square estimation problem uh, or are performing a uh, distributed hypothesis testing, uh, hypothesis testing problem. And this chapter ends with a list of examples that you can find in the book. Um, there are examples of two nature. One, there are examples of physical and natural systems such as you know, um, uh, how does a, a circuit, an electric network behave, the networks of springs, um, uh, so, so systems arising in, sci in the sciences, such as social influence systems and, and animal behavior. So more examples than the ones that I've discussed so far, but then also examples that are engineering examples which are being designed. For example, uh, network control systems, we'll definitely spend some time reviewing them, uh, robotic networks, power grids, and distributed computations examples. Uh, there is a beautiful uh, review of, of the history and, and exercises. And with that, um, I would like to thank you for having attended the first lecture, and I will see you soon again. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.